velocity. And so, but it does attract it somewhat. When it's being attracted, it slows down and it actually will turn. It's at this point where it decelerates. You've heard that term, deceleration. When it decelerates, that's when it produces an X-ray photon. What interaction is this? Ionization. Brim's, Brim's for long radiation. We call it Brim's radiation. Remember that? Breaking radiation. So, any, so the strength of the X-ray photon is dependent on when, where this electron slows down. So if an electron's way out here, what do you think about that attraction to the positive nucleus? Is it gonna be greater or lesser? It'll be less, so it's not going to turn as much. It's not gonna slow down and turn as much. So therefore, the resulting X-ray from that interaction is going to be weaker. The closer it is, the stronger the X-ray. The further away it is, the weaker the X-ray produced. Yes? Can you say what Brems is? Brems is called, it's a, it's a German word, Bremsschlong. <laughs> Brems, <laughs> and it means braking. Braking, like you're putting on the brakes to your car, braking radiation. Although that's not what we call it. We call it Brems. <clears throat> but that's what Bremsschlong. <laughs> Brems. Shrong. Yeah, you know. From Shlong. We're off the porn thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just repeating what it's Nothing called. On, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is Brim's radiation. Okay, there's a characteristic of radiation that is, remember, it's polyenergetic. Do you remember that? Polyenergetic, meaning different energies. Well, that's, what, that's why. Because of Brim's radiation produced, depending on the projectile electron and where it is in relationship to the nucleus, gives us different energies. Okay, so that's where all those different energies come from. So um, here we are, deceleration. This is just a summary of what I said. And it constitutes, of the radiation coming out of the x-ray tube, of that 1% of x-ray production coming out of the tube, most of it is um, produced by Brim's radiation. Okay. So as the, and I don't know, oh, I don't have my animation here. What does the Z number mean? The atomic, the atomic number? atomic number, yeah. that's the atomic number. So as the atomic number increases, tell me what happens to the um, positive energy of that nucleus. Does it increase or decrease? Increase. Of course it increases. The higher the atomic number, the more protons in the nucleus, the stronger the positive energy of the nucleus, therefore the electrons flying by will be more attracted. So you'll have um, more Brim's radiation occurring. So as the atomic number increases, the number of Brim's occurrences increase. also increase. Absolutely. Now here's another one. Let me see if I have a, another picture. No. Okay, so here's the other interaction. If Brim's takes up about 90% of the, makes, makes up about 90% of the X-ray beam energy, then what's the other 10%? The other 10% is characteristic radiation. Characteristic radiation happens in two places, up in the X-ray tube during X-ray production and also in the body, okay? So characteristic radiation, let's follow the bouncing red light. Here's the incident electron or projectile electron that is coming from the cathode it comes and has a direct hit on the electron and knocks it out of its shell. There it is, the ejected electron. Now you have an inner shell vacancy. Anytime you have an inner shell vacancy um, in an atom, an outer shell electron will wanna drop into that, correct? Because again, you have the positive nucleus, so an outer shell electron will be attracted to that. Can an electron move to an outer shell, inner shell to outer shell? Never, no. no, it's always outer to inner, okay, because of the positive um, field here. So you have an inner shell vacancy, here's that one's been knocked out by the incident electron, and here this outer shell electron jumps into that space. And there's no um, proximity issues here, it's not like that one's gonna drop into it, it's not like the next electron, the closest electron, Sometimes it's, it can come from a completely outer shell to the inner shell. It doesn't have to be the next shell, just so you know. So an outer shell electron dro drops into an inner shell space. When that occurs, an X-ray photon is produced. 
Now I can give you the specific strength of this x-ray photon. It's not like Brim's where it can be, you know, strong to weak. This, I know exactly, exactly how strong it is. I, I can give you a specific number. How did I reach that number? Doesn't each layer have the letter and their... This is the K-shell, yeah. L, M. We also can refer to them by numbers, one, two, three, etc. But yeah, K, L, M. Each one of these shells has, has a number assigned to it, and that's the binding energy. Each shell has a binding energy. Okay, so... What would you expect of the bonding energy of the K shell versus the bonding energy of the M shell? Higher. Absolutely is higher because there's a stronger attraction here than way out here because of the distance. Okay, so this would have, and if it is tungsten, then that binding energy is 69 keV. And then that is 12 keV. And this is uh, 6 keV as an example. You'd, I kind of know, not well okay so those if it's gold 79 um, atomic number then gold has a different binding energy here is probably higher than 69 and it has a specific here um, if I if I were a chemist which I'm not and if somebody came up to me and said 69 12 8 3 and 1 I'd got tungsten that's a tungsten now if someone said you know these numbers oh that that's borium, I, you know, I don't know. So, you know, each atom has its specific shells. When you have an outer shell into an inner shell vacancy, you subtract the difference in binding energies and that's how strong the X-ray photon is. Okay? You'd, you'd have to know that, you don't have to have those memorized, but for the K shell, for the K -shell of a tungsten atom, the binding energy of the K shell is 69 kV. So here's my question to you. When, we're, when you're um, taking a hand x-ray, what's your KV that you use? 50, 55. 50 or 55. Are we going to have useful characteristic radiation being produced? Mm -hmm. No, because to knock that electron out of this binding energy of 69 KV, how strong does that have to be? That amount or more? You can't knock this out with anything less than 69, okay? So now um, I say useful characteristic radiation because it's only when this electron is ejected and you subtract these very weak outer K shell, I mean outer shell binding energies from that is where we get 60, about an average energy of um, 69 kV of there are five X-ray photons being produced. I didn't put that slide up there. It's like 69, 57, 54. They're all right close to each other. So they average out to about 69 kV. Okay. So it's only when the K shell electron is ejected that we get strong enough radiation to penetrate a, a body part. So like if this is 12, let's just say this is 12 kV, KeV, and this binding energy is six, it's not six, but some it's low. So what the, what is the strength of that X-ray photon if this one jumps into this vacancy? Six. Six kV. What is that, what can you do with that? Nothing. 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 So it's only when the K-shell electron is ejected that you have 57 up to 69 kV in X-ray energy, which we can use. So that's one. That one has to be knocked out to have functional characteristics. Yes. Radiation. So any interaction that we have with the X-ray beam um, in the X-ray tube, you're going to get characteristic radiation no matter what. However, the key to that question is useful, and that's usually what is said: useful characteristic radiation. The other radiation as characteristic we don't care about because it's so low. So useful is what we can use. And so there will not be any useful characteristic radiation produced um, under 69 kV. You have to have at least strong enough to knock out this electron in that shell. Is this kind of coming back to you? Yeah. <laughs>
So there are two interactions up in the x-ray tube. Well, actually, maybe three. The heat production, Brim's radiation, and characteristic radiation. And so, again, that's just a summary of what I just said, so it's written out for you. <clears throat> so if Brim's is 90% of the x-ray beam, uh, characteristic radiation constitutes the other, the other part of it. So as the atomic number increases, the um, characteristic radiation values will also increase. Okay, those binding energies increase, therefore the X-ray production would increase. And that's why they call it characteristic radiation. It's characteristic of the atom. The X-rays <coughs> produced are characteristic of the atom it's being produced from. So again, a chem maybe a chemist would know this, maybe a medical physicist would know this, but. Um, if you said, oh, the x-ray production is 69, 57, 54, oh, that's tungsten. Or if the x-ray production is 5 and 8 and 10, oh, that's molybdenum. You know, so it's very characteristic of the atom. You change the atom, you change the strength of the characteristic radiation. So here we are looking at a, a graph. This is um, in, your, in your reading. This is from your um, author, from your textbook. Here are the number of x-rays. So the higher it is, the more x-rays we have. And then here is the KEV um, level. So here I've got it at about 90. So an x-ray beam <coughs> is um, being energized and the x-ray beam coming out, right, burst of energy um, is as low as, theoretically it can't be zero, but let's just for you know, argument's sake, zero all the way up to 90. If I um, select 90 kV on my control panel, I cannot have any x-ray energy greater than that. I mean, that number and less. With the majority being at about one-third. So the peak, um, most of the x-ray photons coming out of the tube are going to be at about 30 kV. One-third of 90. So most of them are at, what can you do with 30 unless you're doing mammography? Not a lot. So this part of the beam is the useful part of the x-ray production. What's going to happen to that 1 kV photon, that 2 kV, the 5 kV, what happens to those when you're taking an x-ray? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, some of these will scatter, but I'm talking about, so, well, 25, what will 25 kV penetrate? Nothing. What about a little finger? No. You have to have about 50, don't you? No amount of mass will compensate for an inadequate amount of KV. You do not have enough KV to penetrate a body part. It doesn't matter how many X-ray photons you have. They have to be strong enough to penetrate. So, um, so from here on, these will not penetrate anything. So what happens to them? Where do they go? Do they go, does a 25 kV photon go, oh, we're x-raying a finger, I'm not useful, so I'll just stay up here in the tube? <coughs> Interact with the air molecules? So where are they gonna go? In the patient. Yeah. The patient's gonna absorb those energy x-ray photons. Those low energy x-ray photons that don't have enough to penetrate will be absorbed in the patient. Okay, so um, there's 30. And then, um, so here's what MA, now this line right here represents the characteristic radiation. That is going to be produced at about 69, 70 kV-ish, right around in here, okay? So that's the characteristic radiation. Okay, so now we have, my question to you is, we have 200 MA and 400 MA. Um, what happens to the Brim's radiation? What happens to Brim's radiation? Does it get stronger? Does it get weaker? Does it get more? Does it get less? What happens to it? More. You get more. And, and you, you get more. And <laughs> you get more. <laughs> Just by virtue of, right, if you're going from 200 MA to 400 MA, what happened to the quantity of um, the amount of electrons being produced at the cathode? Producing they more. doubled, right? So guess what happens to the amount of x-ray production? It doubles. 
So very simply, um, Brim's radiation, the more x-ray, uh, the more electrons you have, the more x-rays you're going to have. So therefore, Brim's is going to increase. Um, what about the characteristic radiation? Do you see the um, taller line and the shorter line? Well, certainly, the you just have more characteristic occurrences happening. Did the strength of the characteristic radiation change? No, it's still at the same level, 70 kV, but the number changed, didn't it? Okay, let's look at what happens when we increase our kV. There's one in your book that looks like this, but I don't like it. Um, the kV is real close together, so you don't see a difference. So I like this picture because um, we're going from 80 to 100, so that's quite a jump. So what happens when you increase kV? What happens up in the x-ray tube when you increase kV? What happens to those electrons? They're fast, moving faster. They go faster. Higher the kV, the faster the electrons go. Okay, so for the same period of time at 80 kV, the same period of time at 100, which one are you going to get more radiation? 100. At 100, because they're going faster for the same period of time. So is it a double? No, it's not like, not like MA. Your MA is your primary controlling factor. KV is a secondary controlling factor. Remember that? So, um, so, so there, therefore, that's why you get more x-rays at, you know, quantity at 100. But look at what happens to the overall average energy. Remember, the overall average energy, the peak, is going to be at about one-third of this. So one-third of 100 <coughs> is 33-ish. And then the peak at 80 is going to be less than that, 25 or so, 23, anyway. So as KV increases, what happens to Brehm's radiation? Increases. It increases also. Does that make sense? And then again, look at characteristic radiation. See, this one's showing it right at 70. So again, you're going to have more characteristic radiation, but the strength of the characteristic radiation has not changed is still at 70. So filtration, I just talked about what happens to all these low energy x-ray photons when we image a patient. We said, well, they go to the patient, the poor patient. How mean is that? So we add filtration. What's the purpose of filtration? Hardens the beam. I'm so glad you said that, and thank you both <laughs> for speaking up. Yes, filtration hardens the beam, but that is not the purpose of filtration. Tell me what the purpose of filtration does. Reduces patient radiation. Reduces patient radiation. That radiate the low X-ray energy instead of being absorbed in the patient's body, that thin piece of aluminum is a lightweight metal strong enough to absorb those low, weak energy X-ray photons. The strong ones go right through it like it's not even there, and therefore we clean up. It's not all of it, but we absorb, that filter absorbs some of those low energy x-ray photons so that the patient doesn't. So see, we're, we know we're good. We take care of our patients, okay? So now, the, of course, the more aluminum or copper, whatever the filter might be, um, what's that going to do? It's going to reduce the number of x-rays produced to the patient, okay? So you can think filtration, what is it doing? It's absorbing those low energy x-ray photons. So therefore, you're gonna have less x-ray photons hitting the patient. So theoretically, what happens to the Brim's radiation? It goes down. It decreases. So here's your four millimeter of aluminum filtration. Here's two millimeters. So again, look at the quantity, less, okay? Quantity, more, okay? The more aluminum you have, the less radiation reaching the patient. Uh, now, we, we did say harden the beam, and that is absolutely true. Look what happens to the peak. The average energy shifts to the right with more filtration. Um, so let's, um, do you know why it hardens the beam? The, why does the average energy? I tried to, I tried to reduce the number of <laughs> Okay, let's say we have two beams. Remember this, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, It's just incre one. it increases the average, right? Because it, you're taking on. Yes, it increases the average. Because of, because the of average. smaller numbers are being so taken out. So here's, you know, your beam with, without filtration, and this ends up being um, uh, 50, 55, you can check my math, 55 divided by 10, I have 10 numbers, that is 5.5 average energy. 
So I'm going to do a filter now, and I am going to take out those lower energy x-ray photons. So I add this up, and it's, I think, 80. Divide by 5. I, I don't know what it is. What is it? Uh, 30, 40 is 40. Divided by 5 is 80. 80. <laughs> I got there. Um, so the average, the average energy is stronger with the filtration. Does that make sense? So that's what we mean by hardness of being the overall average energy is increased. That's just a result. That is just a result of having filtration. Usually there's always a consequence to everything we do good. So here we are protecting the patient. It hardens the beam. Is that a problem? Not really. You know, um, but it does more for patient protection than we care about. <coughs> So as filtration increases, what happens to Brim's radiation decreases. So that's the only one that's inverse. Let's change the atomic number. Now we're all over the place. We have molybdenum, rhodium, tungsten, and gold. Um, gold is actually a higher atomic number. It would be better at producing x-rays except for the fact that it can't take the heat. So we have to find a metal that can withstand the heat being produced. And so that's why while it tends to not be efficient at producing x-rays, um, it can withstand the heat, which is the major problem. So here, um, molybdenum 42, rhodium, they don't have that on there. Um, so low atomic numbers, therefore the uh, nucleus has less protons in it, so there's not much attraction of those electrons flying by. So whereas tungsten and gold would certainly have more. Now, um, you can't have any more x-rays than what you put into your control panel, so we're still at 90, but you can um, see, look at what happens to the characteristic radiation. Okay, again, the difference in bonding energy. The lower um, energy um, target, the um, characteristic, the bonding energies <coughs> will be less, therefore the x-rays produced will be weaker. You get into your higher atomic numbers. So there's only one thing that will change the strength of characteristic radiation. There's only one thing that will change the strength of characteristic radiation, and that is atomic number. Okay. Not MA, not KV, just atomic number. Okay, so here's a little, little review. So let's, uh, let's increase MA, let's increase KV, let's increase filtration, and let's increase the atomic number. So what's going to happen if we increase the MA, what happens to the Brim's radiation? Increases. It increases. Oh. It increases. What happens to the number of the characteristic radiation, the number of occurrences? Increases. It's going to also increase. What about the strength of the characteristic radiation? Does MA control the strength? It stays the same, right? It stays the same. Okay. Okay, increase in the KV, what happens to the Brim's radiation? Increases. It increases. What about the characteristic, the number of occurrences? Increases. Yes. Anytime you have more x-rays, you're going to have more occurrences. But tell me about the strength. Also increases. With KV, increase the KV, what happens to characteristic radiation? Stays the same. Uh, filtration increases. What happens to the energy, the overall energy? Remember you said filtration hardens the beam, which is absolutely correct. So the average energy does what? Increases. When we have filtration, what happens? Increases. It increases. What happens to the number of Brim's radiation? Decreases. That decreases. The number of characteristic occurrences? Decreases. That decreases. What about the strength? stays the same. There's only one thing that changes the strength of the characteristic radiation and that's the atomic number. So what happens here? The strength of the characteristic with the increase in atomic number, what happens? Increases. It increases. What happens to the Brim's radiation? Increases. Increases. The strength that you increase the atomic number, <coughs> you have more protons in the nucleus, and those electrons flying by will be more likely to be attracted, to be attracted, to slow down, to turn, and produce an X-ray photon. More X-ray, more interaction. Interaction. I mean, more, more electrons, 
more x-ray interactions. Okay? But there's only one that's going to change the strength. And notice I say the strength. Now, if you get a question that says, um, as the KV increases, the characteristic radiation, what? Blank. You're going to say does not change. Okay? If, it's, if, they, if it is not specified for strength or number, then assume it's strength. If it's not, well, I'm sorry. I apologize. But that's usually when you go through a test book or whatever, it doesn't really clarify. I broke it down. But yes, sir. The filtration is the low, the low um, x-ray energies, right? The filtration absorbs the low energy x-ray photons. So if the characteristic of a 69 is like somewhere in the, or, or tungsten is around 69, 70, that also still, the filtration still lowers the characteristics, even though it's at 69? It lowers the number of occurrences, not the strength. There's only one thing that determines the strength of characteristic radiation. Right, not the strength, but the, the filtration is still absorbing the 69? Yeah. Well, that's pretty strong. The 20s and 30s? It's, it's aluminum, so it's going to absorb the lower energies, not the higher ones. Okay. So I don't know that it would absorb a 69 photon. If you had enough aluminum, it might. But I wouldn't <coughs> think so. That's pretty strong. Because the goal of, of the filtration is not to absorb primary radiation, right? Yeah, it's no, just to absorb no, the yes, radiation. that's right. exactly right. The, the filtration is aluminum. It's a lightweight metal. It's not lead. It's not lead. That's a different story. So the lightweight metal is just enough for those lower energy x-ray photons. They're, they're very weak. And so the aluminum is sufficient for that. Does that answer? Well, I'm just wondering on the uh, filtration column. Which one? This one? The second purple. Number of characteristics radiation also lowers if you the have occurrences. Filtration. Oh, occurrence. Right. The quant. Let me let's let's go back to this. The quantity. Right. Right. Here. Um, because filtration absorbs. So look right here. Here's four millimeters. So, so it's going to absorb more radiation. So therefore, brims and characteristic, the amount will decrease. Okay. Right? Just by, just by virtue of the aluminum absorbing more x-rays, whether it's characteristic or brims. Does that answer it? Thanks. I'll keep working on it if I have it. It's not biased to what it's filtrating. It's going to, no, the, oh, the thicker yeah. it is, it's going to absorb it. Right. I, that's a good way. Did you hear that? It's not biased on whether it's rent. I will really hear it in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you listen to it again? Yeah. <laughs> okay. My professor Nick. You got it, Dan. Here for you. Um, I got it. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to go down into the body, and x-rays interacting with atoms of the body. So you're not that high atomic number of tungsten anymore, now you're dealing with low atomic number. Oxygen is atomic number of eight, I think. Nitrogen, carbon is, I think, you know, 12. Um, so very, very low atomic numbers in the body. So the interactions that happen with X -ray, the X-ray beam and matter, the body, are the, these three, classical, Compton, and photoelectric. These are the ones that um, we deal with in radiology. There are two others, pair production and photo disintegration that are in radiation therapy. So if you're going into radiation therapy, you'll, you'll be learning a lot more about those. The first three are what we deal with in um, radiology. So look, let's look at these. Here comes the incident X-ray photon. It interacts with the atom, um, but I don't see any ionization. And that's one thing, now she tells me, um, that's one thing you need to look at with each of these inter 